Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our 2015 Financial Aid Night. I'm Jen Nectarline, College and Career Counselor here at Hunterdon and Central. And if you've been to any of our programs over the last three and a half to four years, you've probably heard quite a bit of me. Tonight, I get to take a little bit of a seat and turn it over to the expert because financial aid truly is um, a very um, specific topic and one that we are versed in in the counseling department, but one that we do seek out our resident expert, um, Kristen, who I'll introduce in a moment, who's been with us for many years, um, graciously giving her time to talk with you guys about this process. So tonight we'll be focused on the financial aid process, really targeting those that are applying for aid after January 1st for the next calendar year, next school year, next school year, 16, 17. And we may have a couple underclassmen families in the audience, that's fine, great information for you, but really focusing on what's going on for our current seniors. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, a lot of seniors are asking their counselors and myself at the present time, where can I find scholarships? Tell me more about financial aid. We recognize it and we do have information actually going out to them tomorrow. This night really sort of kicks off our financial aid process and our discussion of this, um, the FAFSA scholarships and things like that. But just to give you guys some information, the listserv that goes to your senior children tomorrow will come to you, but it will detail ways that the seniors can find scholarships. So we will give them some sites that we think are pretty reputable that they can go and search for scholarships, create a profile, and have scholarships sent to them on a regular basis that match their criteria. We'll also talk about how we um, offer scholarships through our department, so our local scholarship program, which will kick off in the second week of February, so you're going to look for emails about that. Again, that's our local scholarship program, second week of February, and what that is is uh, annually we offer scholarships from the local community memorials, different donors, organizations, businesses, and that typically is about 80 to 90 different scholarships. Last year we um, gave away about 200, a little over $200,000 to about 115 seniors that applied for those scholarships, went through the application process, and we finished with a really nice awards night in May. So that's our local scholarship program. And then as a department, we receive a lot of different scholarship offerings from the state and national awards. Anything we receive, individual awards, all get posted to the scholarship list on Navion. So all of that will be detailed in an email to seniors tomorrow, along with a recap of tonight. Um, you know, typically we don't see a lot of students at a program like tonight, but we obviously want them to know um, about the process, especially if you're going to be having them join in with you and completing the FAFSA, things like that. So we're going to be sending a lot of information to the students tomorrow, and in turn that will come to you. Everything tonight is going to be on our website. We do have quite a financial aid um, page on our website with tonight's presentation and video and some other links and resources that Kristen might mention. We'll get everything from tonight posted. So if you have any friends, neighbors that couldn't make it, just know it'll all be on. Online. So I'm going to turn it over now um, to our expert. Um, so please join me in welcoming the Associate Director of Financial Aid from Monmouth University, Kristen Isaacson. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out this evening. So I'm going to talk to you about the financial aid process. I'm going to talk to you about some terms um, that you'll hear through the process, some tools to use as you go through the financial aid process. We'll talk about sources, types of aid. I'll give you tips. I'll give you some questions to think about as you move forward in the process. I just want to see by a show of hands, where do I have, do I have any junior families here tonight? Just so I know, just a couple, okay. And then seniors, everybody else, yeah, okay. All right, so then I know what things to um, point out to you and whatnot. So, what is financial aid? Financial aid is money that helps a student pay for education expenses at a post-secondary school, and that can be college, vocational school, or graduate school. Our goal in, I'm not touching it and things are moving. Um, our goal in financial aid is to assist students in paying for college, and we do this by evaluating a family's ability to pay for educational costs, we distribute limited resources in an equitable manner, and we provide a balance of what we call gift aid and self-help aid. Gift aid are things like grants and scholarships that do not have to be repaid, and self-help aid are things like loans and work study. Okay, so I said I would tell you about some terms. So the first term is something called the federal methodology. And this relates to the application we'll talk about tonight, the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA. Um, 
for financial aid purposes, every school is going to ask you for this application at a minimum. They may ask for more, but they're going to ask you for this application at a minimum. We're going to go over it, but when you fill this out, all of the information you put on it is run through this formula called the federal methodology. This formula was created by Congress, and it determines a number, a number that we call your expected family contribution, or EFC. And the expected family contribution is the amount a family can reasonably be expected to contribute toward the cost of the student's education for one academic year. It stays the same regardless of college choice because it's based on the income information, household size information, all of that that you put on this application, not anything to do with the actual college the student will attend. So that means that that number stays the same. We get it. It's processed. You have that expected family contribution. That's your number for that year. Um, when we do receive um, uh, process FAFSAs at colleges with that expected family contribution number on it, we're going to use that to determine the types and amounts of aid the student is eligible for during the upcoming school year. So it is the number that drives the whole financial aid process. Okay, and where does it come from? In a simplified manner, we have a contribution from parents from both your income and assets, and we also have a contribution from students, from the student's income and assets. We have many other things that go into that expected family contribution, but I really like to point out that we have both a parental contribution as well as a student contribution. Okay. One of the other terms that you'll hear through the financial aid process is something called a cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is the overall cost to attend a college for the school year. So you can see I have a long list of items that are included in the cost of attendance. You have everything from book tuition and fees and books and supplies to things like transportation and personal expenses, even a computer. Um, so we say we have billable expenses like tuition and fees, room and board if the student's living on campus. But then we have other um, indirect costs and still costs you need to be prepared for when your student goes to college. You need to be prepared for the cost of books and supplies. You need to be prepared for the cost of transportation. They need to get to and from school. And are, it means different things. Are they living at home and driving somewhere to class? Or do they, you live here in New Jersey and they're going to go to school in California? And how many round trip tickets will they get? Um, so it is uh, an expense you need to be prepared for. And personal expenses include things like doing laundry, buying shampoo, buying soap, buying toothpaste. You still have to live while you're in school. So remember, cost of attendance, overall cost to attend the institution for the school year. Okay, last term that I'm going to tell you about is financial need. When you go through the financial aid process, you'll hear that certain types of aid require financial need. It's a need-based award program. So how do we determine who has financial need and for how much? We do the equation that I have on the screen. We take your cost of attendance, we subtract from it the expected family contribution, the number we get from you filing your application for aid, and that gives us your financial need. So let's take a look at that with some numbers to fill in and give you a better idea of what this looks like. Looking at two different schools. One has a cost of attendance of $30,000. In my example, my EFC is 15,000, which means I have 15,000 in financial need at that first institution. I'm looking at another school, a little bit more expensive, $55,000 cost of attendance. My EFC is still $15,000, giving me $40,000 in financial need at the second institution. So still, what does that mean in real life? That means at school number one, I can get up to $15,000 in need-based financial aid. At school number two, up to $40,000 in need-based financial aid, if it's available. Not every college can guarantee to fulfill 100% of a student's financial need. If that's something that you're interested in, you can do a Google search for colleges that fulfill 100% of financial need. I've done it, I've tried it, it does work. You can get um, kind of a list of schools that do. Um, if your student already has some choices, it's um, if you don't find the information on their financial aid webpage, you can always call the financial aid office to ask about that. Okay, so now some tools. Uh, first thing that I have is something called a net price calculator. The net price calculator um, allows you to enter some income information on a, it's all through an individual college's website, 
And once you enter the income information, it will return to you an estimate of the aid eligibility at that particular institution. So it's really helpful in finding out what you might qualify for at a particular school. Every college in New Jersey has to have, uh, in New Jersey, every college in the United States has to have one. Um, and usually you can find the net price calculator on their financial aid webpage. Um, so this is an easy way to, um, to get an idea of the aid you might be eligible for. Yes? Usually when you use, de depending upon how the calculator works um, and what the school, because there is some latitude in how fancy they are, some may ask you if you already have an expected family contribution, you can plug it in. If you don't, then you'll plug in the income information so it can determine the eligibility. So it works either way. Um, another tool that we have for you to get an early estimate of your expected family contribution is something called the FAFSA Forecaster. This is something that's put out by the Department of Education, and you would go to the website fafsa.gov, and there's an area down at the bottom of the screen, and it says under the heading of thinking about college, and it says use FAFSA Forecaster to see how federal student aid can help you pay for college. When you click on that, it's going to take you into some screens where you can enter the same information you would enter on the real FAFSA, but this one isn't getting processed. Um, it's not being sent out to any schools, so that way you can do it at any time. You can do it if you're a freshman, you can do it if you're a senior, because it's not going anywhere. So that's a tool that we have to get an early read on your federal aid eligibility and your expected family contribution. Now, to file for real, you still will go to FAFSA.gov, but you're going to click on the green Start a New FAFSA button. Um, that is where all the new applications will start. If later on you need to go back and make any corrections or add anything, update any information, you would go back to the same FAFSA.gov, but then you would click the Login button because you already have an application and you just want to log in to the application itself. Uh, for my senior families, you can do this starting January 1. So that is the earliest it's there. This week I was at another school and the parent was like, is it there any sooner? Like, can I go on on December 31st? And I'm like, nope, you have to wait until 1201 on January 1. It really is not um, out there until January 1st. Um, and one of the new things related to filing your FAFSA is the way to access um, the actual application once you go click that start a new FAFSA um, and the way that you're signing the application. It's still an electronic process, but for those of you that have an older child that's been through college, you might have something called a PIN number, a four-digit number that you use to access the site and sign the application. Those are no good. Um, in May, the federal government switched over to what's called an FSA ID process, where you create your own username and password to access the FAFSA website. It's used as your electronic signature, and for students, it also gives them access into some of the other federal websites that are related to financial aid. It's bringing the FAFSA in line with security and um, eliminating the need for students to constantly type in their last name, first initial, date of birth, and social security number. Um, if you do have a PIN number, you'll be able to link your FSA ID to, uh, if you have the PIN, you can link the PIN to the FSA ID to make the process a little easier. One of the sheets that I brought with me tonight um, does say, uh, gives you some information about creating the FSA ID. My main recommendation with this is when you go to create it, write everything down. There are many security questions that you will have to either answer or create through the, um, through the process. So you'll want to make sure some of the questions you'll select from a drop down and then provide an answer. There are other questions you're going to have to create the question and the answer. And the student and one parent need these FSA IDs, so that's a lot of security questions to keep track of. So I suggest that you write everything down so that you have it, because in case you need to go to those security questions, you forget the username or password, you have the answers to those security questions to retrieve the information. I want to show you a little bit about what the application looks like when you log into it. Uh, so 
This is a student application, and the majority of the information on the FAFSA is about the student, not about parents. So they try to help you with what information is needed on which screen. So screens with student information say student down the left-hand side. When it comes to parent information, there's a color change, and it says parent. So it's important if you're the parent filling out this application that you know who you are and when you are on each of these pages so that you fill it out correctly. If you start off putting your own name on the application, it's your FAFSA, yay, you can go back to school. Um, but your child will not have a FAFSA. Um, it's important also paying attention when you get to the income section. There's income questions for students and for parents. They're the exact same questions. But the federal government assumes that students are sitting down to fill this out. So in the student section, it says, what is your adjusted gross income? You forget who you are, and you as the parent fill in your income. You go to the parent section, and even though it says, what's your parents' adjusted gross income, you still fill in the same number. So both you and your student then have made the same amount of money in that school year which would, I'm sure, greatly affect their financial aid eligibility. So that's why it's important to make sure you put the right person's information on the right pages. If you are unsure how to answer a question on any of the pages that you get to, all of them have this help and hints box along the right-hand side. So if you're not sure, read the information that's in the help and hints box, and that should help you answer any of the questions on that particular screen. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit more information about the application for 2016-17, so that's what all my senior families are going to be doing. Filing on or after January 1. However, you want to be checking the individual colleges that your student is interested in to see if they have a deadline. There are schools that can have deadlines as early as like February 15th to get it in to ensure all possible eligibility. So that's what you need to do. Check with all the schools. What's the earliest deadline? Okay, that's I have from January 1 to that deadline to get my FAFSA in. Um, you do need to file it each year for each student that you'll have in college. For 16-17, we will be using 2015 income. If you will not have taxes prepared in time to file the FAFSA by that by the earliest deadline that you're looking at. You can estimate income. When we talk about the application itself, I will tell you where you can pull some numbers from to estimate so that you're getting something that is a reasonable um, estimate. Now, what I wanna do is tell you some information about 1718 because there are some changes that are going to be happening. So my senior families, you're going to be doing this one way for the freshman year. It's gonna be a little different for sophomore year. My junior families, this is the way you're gonna do for their freshman year. So we are switching to what's called a prior prior year format, which means that we're going to be using on the FAFSA income that's two years old. So in 1718, we will again be using 2015 income. So those that will be in school in 1617 and 1718 will use their 2015 income twice. That only happened the one year as we move into this um, new process. And you'll be able to file the FAFSA as early as October 1st, 2016. So whereas right now we can't file till January 1, that deadline's gonna, that opening is gonna move up into October 1st of next year. And hopefully, most of you will no longer have to estimate your income um, on the FAFSA because you have long since completed your tax returns. Your tax returns for 2015 would be due in April of 2016 and if you file the FAFSA in October, it's months after your taxes have been completed. Um, so uh, that way you can have a more correct and complete FAFSA right from the start. There was a, a gold sheet that I had out on the table that will give you some additional information about these changes. There's a little chart on the back to go over the years that you'll be reporting um, each year. Basically, what's on that sheet is all the information that I have. President Obama signed this as an executive order in September. We in the financial aid offices are still waiting on more information from the Department of Education. Our National Association has a task force to investigate all this because we have questions. I'm sure you're gonna have questions. So I, I'm seeing this as kind of a process that might be changing as we move forward, but I just wanna make you aware of it so that it doesn't become, but that lady told me something different last year. Yes, I did because we have two different things in each year. So just wanna make you aware of that change coming up. 
So let's take a look at our eligibility requirements for completing the FAFSA. Students need to have a high school diploma or its equivalent. They need to be enrolled or accepted for enrollment in an eligible program of study that leads to a degree, certificate, or some other recognized credential. Students also need to be US citizens or eligible non-citizens. They need to have valid social security numbers, and if required, they need to be registered with Selective Service, or they can use the FAFSA to register themselves. Um, one tool that we have to help you in completing the income portion of the FAFSA is something called the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. This allows you in real time to download your income information from the IRS into the FAFSA. You will authenticate your identity with the IRS, provided they find you, they will show you the income that it would transfer. You can say yes or no. If you say yes to transferring it, it takes just a couple seconds and it loads all that income information right into your FAFSA. Now, there are some things to look out for with the data retrieval. You do need to give the IRS time to process your tax returns before they're available to use for retrieval. Um, if you file an electronic re tax return, it's at least two to three weeks after filing before you're eligible to use the data retrieval tool, and at least four to six after filing a paper tax return. It does help reduce the number of documents that the financial aid office may ask for you later on in the process if you're selected for verification. I didn't touch anything. And it, there's a ghost up here. Um, and... Uh, the most important bullet on that screen is the fourth one. You can use it to make FAFSA corrections. So for my senior families, you're estimating on your FAFSA the first go around because you've got a February 15th deadline. Then you get your taxes filed. You need to update the information. The federal government sends out notifications after April 15th to remind you to update the income. So when you get it done, you can go back into FAFSA.gov, log in, and then when you're in the income section, you can go through the questions to do the data retrieval at that point. For the following year, for 1718, everyone that's filing in 1718, most likely you'll just be able to use the data retrieval tool right from the beginning because your taxes will have been filed like six months before that. So um, that's one thing that will hopefully be easier with the new process. But also realize that the data retrieval tool doesn't fill in every single income question. Not every question is something that's on a tax return. So just make sure you review everything before submitting it. OK, so what I brought with me tonight is something called a FAFSA on the web worksheet. You will see on top that this is for 2015-16. The 16-17 one isn't available yet. However, there's not going to be a huge amount of change between the two years, so this will still give you um, good guidance on um, what will be expected on the FAFSA. Um, we do recommend for any students that are going to school in New Jersey that you do answer the optional driver's license question because it's needed for state aid purposes. So it's best to just complete it on the FAFSA itself. Okay, so let's talk about what we have in here. When you open it up and you take a look, like I said, the whole first section is about students. It's going to be all student demographic information, things like name, address, phone number, social security number, date of birth, citizenship status, marital status, um, registering with selective service, grade level, highest grade level completed by each parent. So I say it's information students should know better than I do. Um, and then section two is very important. It determines whether a student is dependent or independent. Dependent students have to provide parental information on the FAFSA. Independent students do not. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take, we're going to take a look at these on here. I'm going to read over everything. You'll see that you have a bunch of statements in this section. How it works is if none of those statements apply to the student, then they're moving on to the parental section. They're a dependent student. If at least one of them applies to the student, then they're independent and do not need to provide parental information. Um, when you actually answer them on the FAFSA itself, they will be yes or no questions, so um, just so you know um, how it'll look on the application itself. And as I read over them, I'm gonna update the years and dates for um, how it would look for 1617. So I was born before January 1, 1993. I am serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces. Since I turned age 13, both of my parents were deceased. I was a dependent or ward of the court since turning age 13. I am married. I am a veteran of the US Armed Forces. I was in foster care since turning age 13. I am currently, or I was, an emancipated minor. 
before you run out tomorrow morning to the courthouse to emancipate all of your children. I will tell you that in New Jersey, emancipation is used strictly as it relates to child support. So if a child is emancipated, it means there's somebody that does no, no longer has to pay child support for that child. That is not what the FAFSA needs as far as emancipation is concerned. So all New Jersey residents have to answer no to that question. So I've given you one answer already. Um, I will be working on a master's or doctorate program. I now have or will have children for whom I will provide more than half of their support between July 1, 2016 and June 30th, 2017. I have dependents other than children or my spouse who live with me and I provide more than half of their support. I am currently or I was in legal guardianship. We find mistakes on that question. Students answer it yes, not realizing um, that it's a mistake. They say yes, I have legal guardians, my mom and dad. In this case, legal guardianship has been removed from the parents for some reason and, the, and it's given to someone else. So that's just one to make sure that you do answer it um, appropriately, if the student is in legal guardianship, fine. Um, most likely, they're not. Um, and I am homeless or I'm at the risk of being homeless. So for tonight's purposes, we're going to move on and look at the parental information. But I will say that if anyone here is a grandparent, aunt, uncle, foster parent, anything like that, um, I am happy to talk with you after the program about the student's particular circumstances and help you with completing that section of the FAFSA. So you can see when we move on, the color changes because now we're in parental information. I'm gonna give you a few questions that will be on the FAFSA that are not on the worksheet so that you can be prepared for them. It will ask you for your marital status and it's your marital status as of the day you complete the FAFSA. You get to choose between married, remarried, that's all one answer, divorce separated, which is another answer, uh, widowed, uh, single, and uh, unmarried, but both parents living together. So I'm going to give you some examples so that you know what your marital status should be. If I have my student whose name is John, he lives with his legal parents who are married to each other. The marital status is married, and he puts the income information for both um, parents on the FAFSA. Now, if John's parents get divorced, and John remains living with his mother, the marital status is the divorce separated, and he'll only put income information for his mother. In divorce situations, the FAFSA looks at the custodial parent, or the parent that the student lived with more during the last 12 months. That's the parent that goes on the FAFSA. It doesn't matter who claims the child on a tax return. It doesn't matter what your divorce decree says. It is the parent that the student lived with more during the last 12 months. Um, and then it's only that parent that goes on the FAFSA. Now, if John's mom gets married to somebody else, her marital status goes back to married, remarried, um, and both his mother and his stepfather's income information go on the FAFSA. Reporting the step-parent's income information does not require that step-parent to pay the student's bill, does not require them to co-sign for a loan. However, that income is a resource in that household and it will be used to determine the expected family contribution. And there's no appealing that. You can't ask the school, you can't ask the federal government to take the income out. It has to stay in there. That's the requirement. Um, and I will tell you our newest marital status, um, it's a few year, been on the FAFSA for a couple of years, is unmarried and both parents living together. So if you're in a situation where you've never been married, both of you are the legal parents, you're both going to put your income information on the FAFSA. This also includes people, you are married, you got divorced, you like each other again, you've moved back in together, both of you are going on the FAFSA. Um, you'll be asked the household size, so our household size has one or two parents based on the marital status. We have at least one child in the household, the one that this FAFSA is for. Any other children that you're supporting and if there are any other people in your household, you have to be providing more than 50% of their support. So for instance, your own parents are living in, you know, they're living in the same house with you. You have to determine if you're providing more than half of their support to determine whether they're in the household size. You'll also be asked for the number in college. It's only um, children that can be in the number in college and it's always at least one, the one that the FAFSA is for. 
uh, at least one parent has to provide their last name, first initial, date of birth, and social security number. Always double check that information, whether it's for you as the parent or when you're listing it for your student, because it is cross-checked with the Social Security Administration, and if you make a mistake, it's a mistake that has to be corrected. You might have to submit documentation to the college, so that's one spot that you can easily fix and make sure it's correct right from the start. Then you move into the income information, and it will change to did your parents file or will they file a 2015 income tax return. You have a choice between my parents have completed the return, my parents will file, my parents are not going to file. So for those of you that are in that window where you will not have the tax return completed, you're gonna choose the second option that you will file, but you have to give it some income information. So you can pull out your 2014 in, uh, tax return. If you know that your income hasn't changed much from 14 to 15, use that as your source document. If you'll have your W-2s in time, but just not enough time to fully prepare the tax return, use them. Um, you can also use an end of the year pay stub because that too will total up your income and at least give you a point of reference instead of picking numbers out to put on the application. And then like I said, you'll just log back in when your taxes are complete and update the information. Uh, you will be asked for your adjusted gross income, and you see on there it asks to separate out um, earnings from work for each parent if there are two parents. Other income questions that it will ask for are questions related to the tax return. It will ask the type of return that you filed, the status that you filed it under, so were you married filing jointly, married filing separately, single, head of household, whatever it is. Um, you'll be asked the number of exemptions. Um, you'll also be asked the amount of taxes paid. Then you move into some benefit uh, information, and the years will update in that question as well, so it will be in 2014 or 15, did anyone in your parents' household receive any of the following? If any of those benefits were received, you'll just click the appropriate box. When you look over the information in the additional financial information and untaxed income boxes, when you review any of those, if any of them apply to you, you will have to report the amount that was either received or paid out in 2015. So I usually recommend recording that down in the note section at the bottom so that you have that figure um, when you're ready to go online. And you can see there at the bottom it says you might be asked questions about your assets. So three asset questions, all of which are as of the day you complete the FAFSA. The first is the amount that you have in cash savings and checking accounts, the net worth of your investments, and the net worth of a business or farm. So, my small business owners, if you have 100 or fewer full-time employees and your business is family-owned and controlled, you do not have to come up with a net worth to your business. As far as investments are concerned, you do not have to include the home that you live in. I will say with an asterisk, if you live in a multifamily home, it's your house, you rent out this part and you live in the other part, we just need to know about the part that you rent out, not the portion that you live in. If you have any other real estate, you have a shore house, you have land somewhere, all of those things are reported as investments. For all my families with 529 college savings plans, I'm going to read to you from the directions on the FAFSA how they are reported. For students that report parental information on the FAFSA, the accounts are reported as a parental investment, and it includes all accounts owned by the student, as well as all accounts owned by the parents, for all members of the household. So I'm just the messenger on that portion. Um, so that means any accounts that you have that are owned by the student, or owned by you as the parents, for any member of the household, are all reported as a parental investment. So if you have three kids and you have three 529 plans, all three of them totaled up go as a parental investment on the FAFSA. Um, you do not have to include the value of life insurance um, and your retirement plans. So whatever you do have saved up in a 401k, in any sort of pension plan, annuity, a non-education IRA, um, those also do not count as investments. And then, oops, I didn't mean to hit that. I meant to flip my page here. So we've gotten to the end of parental income. When we get to the back of this, we're back to student information. And guess what? The income questions are exactly the same as they are in the parent section. 
be the same thing. Only difference is that students might not make enough money to file a, be required to file a tax return, so they might choose that not going to file option, but they still have to report how much income was earned in 2015. The other things that you have to be prepared for on the FAFSA, one of them is to list all of the colleges you'd like to receive the application. When you complete that FAFSA online, you can list up to 10 schools at any one time. If your student has more than 10 that they're interested in, fill it out with 10. And then when you um, find out that it's been processed, you can log back in, replace some of those initial 10 with the rest of the schools that need the information. Been asked at almost every school that I went to so far this year um, about the order to put them in on the FAFSA and other schools seeing the other schools that are on there. So there are some changes happening for 1617. What's going to happen in 1617 is when you submit the FAFSA and it goes to a particular school, so it comes to me at Monmouth, all that I will see is that the student listed Monmouth on the FAFSA. I will not see any other schools on it. So I will not be able to determine, oh, did they put us first, second, third, fourth, whatever it may be, and potentially use that in uh, awarding any financial aid. Um, so that is something that is, um, that is changing. The only recommendation that I do have, however, is that if a student has um, a first choice New Jersey school, to list that first on the FAFSA. And the reason is that when the information goes to the state of New Jersey to determine the state grant program, they will only determine eligibility at the first school listed on the FAFSA. So if you put an out-of-state school first, but you're also interested in something in New Jersey, you're going to get a notice that says you're not eligible because you're going out of state. So that's my only order recommendation with regard to the FAFSA. Okay, so now, oh, and very last part is to provide um, that um, FSA ID as your signature um, on the FAFSA. Make sure you click through until you get to a confirmation page. Confirmation page has lots of important information on it. I like to start from the bottom of the confirmation page. The very bottom of the page will list out all of the colleges you put on it, and it will provide you with their graduation rate, retention rate, and transfer rate. So if those types of statistics are important to you, it will be right there on the confirmation page. The middle of the confirmation page will give you an estimated expected family contribution, as well as some limited information about the student's federal aid eligibility. The very top has the most important things as far as I'm concerned. Two optional features you should know about. One optional feature is for my families that will have more than one child in college at the same time. You can complete one child's application. When you get to the confirmation page, you'll click transfer parent information into another FAFSA. So that it will do that, it will transfer over the parental information, which is the same between the two students. So for that second child, all you'll have to enter is the student specific information. The other optional feature is um, starting your state aid application. So as I've said, the state of New Jersey has a grant program for those residents that remain in New Jersey for college. They take all of the information on the FAFSA, plus they need a few more bits of information from you. These are questions that are no longer on the FAFSA, so you're not duplicating anything. Um, and you can do that right by clicking from that confirmation page. What you'll be asked for is if in 2015, and this is for both student and parent, was there any earned income credit received? This is a tax credit. It's not your total income. So we do see that people have totaled up their income and put that on there. It's a, it's a, a tax credit and you may or may not qualify for it. Uh, untaxed and taxable social security income will be listed for both student and parent because social security benefits are not put on the FAFSA anywhere. Uh, and un any unemployment compensation. Uh, the driver's license information is just for the student and hopefully if they put it on the FAFSA, it transfers it over and you don't even have to worry about that question. And the other items are only for those students that don't provide parental information on the FAFSA. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to talk about how this process is going to work. So we want to get the FAFSA filed and then we want to get our taxes done as soon as we can. We want to also be checking to see are there any other forms that the college requires. Do they have their own internal application? Maybe some of you have already completed something called a CSS profile. This is an application that charges money to complete it and it's a charge to send it out to each school that wants it. It's used by mainly, mainly private institutions to help further refine who they'll give their institutional dollars to. You only need to fill it out if a school is asking for it. 
When your FAFSA processes, it's about three to five business days after you complete it, you'll receive notification that's been processed um, by email if you provide a valid email address. And um, then the form is what we call a student aid report. And you want to make sure, review it for any, make sure everything's correct. If there are any problems with the processing, it would be listed in that student aid report. If you're selected for a process called verification, it would be listed there as well. The federal government, as well as the state government, select applicants for verification, where we have to make sure what you've listed on the application is indeed correct. Okay, so how do I find out how much aid I'm going to be receiving? This is through um, a process called a financial aid award letter. Award letters may be sent out by mail, they may be sent by email, they may be viewed by logging into an online portal. Regardless of how you receive it, it's all the same thing. A financial aid award letter details the types and amounts of aid the student is eligible for during the upcoming school year. The student re should receive one of these award letters from every college that they put on their FAFSA who accepted them. So they put 10 schools on it, got 10 acceptances, you should get 10 financial aid award letters because each college is going to determine the student's eligibility at that particular institution. Uh, when you receive these award letters, just make sure um, that there's not any additional action that you need to take if there's any sort of acknowledgement or if you've made the decision, this is where we're going, if there's anything that needs to be done with regard to that award letter. And then providing additional documentation if you are selected for verification. And if you decide to use student loans, the school will walk you through that process. We also want to make sure we cover all of our sources for aid. So, we want to make sure we're checking with the college. What do they have? How do I get it? They may have merit-based aid, which is aid that's based on academics, grades, test scores, maybe a combination of the two. They might have aid based on financial need. They may have some of both. So you want to know what you can possibly get and how to get it. The FAFSA takes care of all the federal resources, all the grants, all the loans, and the federal work-study program. So we've taken all, care of all your federal resources with the FAFSA. You'll take care of the state by doing the FAFSA and those few additional questions at the end. You have some other uh, categories as well. And these categories, I say, are very specific types of aid. So things like athletic scholarships, outside scholarships, tuition remission or tuition benefits through a job. Um, in future years, resident assistantships for those students living on campus. If any of you are veterans, there are certain types of veterans benefits that can be transferred to your dependent. Um, there are benefits through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. If anyone is blind or visually impaired, there's a commission for the blind that gives out benefits. So I say they're kind of very specialized types of things, but you might have some of these other sources. You might also be eligible for tax credits. There are tax credits available to higher education costs. I do recommend that you check with your tax provider, uh, tax preparer, uh, to see if you might qualify. If you'd like to, you can look right on the IRS uh, website. They're just at irs.gov, and I believe it's publication 970 that has all the information you could ever want to know about tax credits for higher education. Um, so that may be an option kind of on the back end, not necessarily money you'll get up front to pay for costs, but, some, but a way to reduce your tax burden. Okay, we want to make sure we know all the types of financial aid and what they mean. So if you see that you're receiving a scholarship on your financial aid award letter, that's good. It does not have to be repaid. It's generally awarded on the basis of merit, skill, a unique characteristic, talent, something like that. Grants also do not have to be repaid, but they're generally awarded on the basis of financial need. Loans, money that's borrowed and repaid with interest, and also employment options, whether the student is paid through a paycheck or through some, some sort of non-monetary compensation like their room and board being paid for. Okay, so I wanna give you a little bit of information about the programs that are available. One of the handouts that I had on the table in the back uh, says funding your education up at the top and it folds out. When you fold that all the way out, you'll have a summary of all the federal aid programs there so you don't have to write down everything that I'm saying. And it also gives you all the websites to refer to for all the in-depth information. The federal government's main web, uh, main website, the federal government's main grant program is called the Federal Pell Grant. Um, it's a grant that's available about at both full-time and part-time status. 
For the current school year, for 15-16, the maximum is $5,775 at full-time status. It is a portable grant, so in most cases, what you receive at one college would be the same at another one. The Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant is generally awarded along with the Federal Pell Grant. However, it is limited in nature. Each college has a limited amount to spend in that supplemental grant, and once it's gone, it's gone. We have the latitude to award up to $4,000 per year. However, some schools might award less to give it to more students, while others will maximize it, but give it to a smaller pool of applicants. Um, this is one of those things where deadlines can come into play, because if you file after the deadline, they might not have this funding left. So even if you did qualify, if there's no money left, you can't get it. The Teacher Education Assistance for College and Higher Education, or TEACH grant, is for students interested in teaching in low-income districts in high-need subject areas. There is a teaching component required after the student completes their program. If they do not fulfill the teaching requirement, um, they will have to repay the grant as if it were a loan. And since they can receive up to $4,000 a year, it's a lot to have to repay if that's not the field they want to go into. The handout that I gave you with the websites that you can go back to, it will give you um, places to look for all of the low-income districts around the country, as well as all of the high-need subject areas around the country. Iraq and Afghanistan service grants are for students who lost a parent as a result of their service in either Iraq or Afghanistan. State of New Jersey, that main grant program is something called a tuition aid grant, or TAG. It's for full-time students. Um, however, the award amounts vary based on the type of institution the student attends. So, it's one amount at community colleges, a different amount at four-year public institutions, different amount at uh, private institutions. Rutgers, Rowan, and NJIT also have their own um, award value. So, the maximums are based a little bit more on the cost of the education versus that federal grant being the same regardless of where you attend. With TAG, you do have to be a New Jersey resident and remain in New Jersey for school. NJ STARS is a program for students in the top 15% of their class to go to their local community college and have all of their tuition and, fee, uh, tuition and required fees paid for. If they complete NJ STARS and meet the requirements at the end of doing the NJ STARS program, they can move on to NJ STARS II, which is um, at any of the four-year institutions in New Jersey, they can receive up to a $2,500 scholarship. The Educational Opportunity Fund is for students that are both economically and academically disadvantaged. Family income has to fall below maximums established by the state of New Jersey to even be considered for the program. I believe virtually all schools in New Jersey participate in EOF, so if it is something you're interested in, you can contact the office on the campus that you're interested in. More information on all of these is at njgrants.org. Okay, and then, as Mrs. Nectarline talked about in the very beginning, we want to be looking for our private sources for scholarships. You got all the information on all the local awards that are available. When you want to pull in a more global reach, the main thing is when you're using the internet is that everything should be free. You don't pay to search a scholarship database, nor should you pay to apply for a scholarship. So everything that you're doing should be free. Okay. Once you maximize all of your grant and scholarship eligibility and you have more to pay, you have a gap in funding, well, loans may be a way to help bridge that gap. So I want to give you a little bit of information about how loans work. Um, we have the Federal Direct Loan Program, which is a loan program for students. It's from the federal government. The student is the borrower of the loan. There's no credit check involved and no cosigners involved. We have two types of direct loans, subsidized and unsubsidized. In order to qualify for the subsidized loan, you have to have financial need. Um, what the benefit is of the subsidized loan is that there's no interest accruing while the student's in school or during the six-month grace period after they leave school. The federal government is subsidizing the interest on the loan. Currently, our interest rate is fixed at 4.29%. That's for all loans for the 15-16 year. We will have a new rate that will go into effect on July 1, and it will be for all loans for the 16-17 academic year. It is based on the Treasury bill, so I can tell you um, that between 14-15 and 15-16, we did see a reduction in the rate, but I don't know what might um, happen because the T-bill auction for this hasn't occurred yet. Okay, so then the unsubsidized loan does not require financial need. It will accrue interest from the time we receive the money. 
same interest rate as the subsidized loan. Now, what's important to note is that there is a maximum that a student can receive in the subsidized and unsubsidized loan. This is established by the federal government. So for first year students, $5,500 is the most they can borrow. Within that, no more than $3,500 can be from the subsidized loan. So when you're reviewing award letters, and if you see they've given you $3,500, federal direct subsidized loan, $2,000, federal direct unsubsidized loan, you know you've gotten the most and in the best possible breakdown that's available. Okay, so you've maximized that federal direct loan and you still need more money. What do you do? Well, you can check with the college itself to see if they have an institutional loan program to help you out. For parents, we have a loan from the federal government called a PLUS loan. It's a loan for parents to borrow. The parent is the one responsible for the loan all the way through until it's repaid. It is a credit-based loan and has a fixed interest rate, which currently is 6.84%. Uh, That's the rate for this current school year. The state of New Jersey also has a supplemental loan program in their NJ class program. It too is a credit-based loan. However, it does allow the student to borrow with a credit-worthy cosigner. Interest rate is determined by the repayment option that you choose. So they have four different repayment options. You have four different interest rate choices. They have everything from a variable rate loan that starts repayment right away over 10 years to not making any payments during school and having 15 years to pay it off once they're out of school. Um, and then you also have various private or alternative loans. These are loans offered by banks and lenders uh, for education. They are all credit based and again allow the student to borrow with a cosigner. Um, students at this point need cosigners, certainly in the first and second year and most likely now all the way through school. They just don't have strong enough credit histories to get these loans on their own. With any of these supplemental loans from the PLUS loan, the NJ class loan, or a private alternative loan, you can use them to borrow up to the cost of attendance that I talked about in the beginning. So that means you can cover whatever balance you have on tuition and fees, room and board. You can borrow money for books, transportation, and personal expenses if you need to. Obviously, it is a loan. You will have to pay it back. They all accrue interest from the time that the money is dispersed. But if you don't want to have to put anything out, you can use that funding for those additional expenses. We don't want to forget about our employment opportunities. So like I said, the, Fed, uh, the FAFSA is the application for the federal work study program. Federal work study allows students to work at on campus and community service jobs. Um, if they don't qualify um, through the FAFSA for federal work study, they may have another way for the student to work on campus. That's something to ask at the college. And there's always off campus jobs available. Also, one thing to note, you have to have financial need in order to receive a federal work study. Now, something that can help you with financing the education, it's not necessarily financial aid, but it's still a financial tool, are tuition payment plans. So it's something that you can ask the college if they have a tuition payment plan. This is not a loan. You're making monthly installments toward the tuition. Uh, you can make these installments fit into your monthly budget, and you usually have various payment options um, along with them. So you can have money direct debited out of a bank account. My frequent flyer mile people, you could have it hooked up to your credit card, get your frequent flyer miles out of it, but it's just another tool in financing the education. Okay, so I said I would give you some tips. Always beware of deadlines. You don't want to miss out on any aid because you missed a deadline. And there are a lot of deadlines that are not negotiable. So it doesn't matter why you missed it, you missed it. Always make sure to read all mail and email promptly. If you do this, you won't miss out on any deadlines. Um, I read an article recently about how much mail college students or potential college students ignore. I think it's something like 70% of it. Um, that's not good. Um, I say just open it, take a look. Is it something you need to take action on so again you don't miss out on anything? Always, always, always read the instructions carefully. Review anything before you submit it. It's always easier to catch a mistake before you submit something than having to fix it later on. Um, I always have a FAFSA at my desk because the instructions are the best thing for me to look at. And when people are not sure of something or we need to look at, how is it on the FAFSA? So always be sure to use those instructions. Use that help and hints box on the online application. 
keep copies of everything. Um, these are all financial related documents, so you want to keep copies of everything. Parents, don't sign your son or daughter's name. Use their FSA ID on their financial aid documents. Most of this aid is all theirs. So you should, they need to be involved in the process and have some idea of what's going on. Because once they're enrolled in college, your access to their information changes. It's going to be different than what you're used to here in high school. You're used to being able to talk to teachers, talk to counselors. They can call you, whatever, give you information. Well, that stops at the college level. Your student actually has to give you permission to access their information. Before you have a heart attack, um, most schools do have a way for students to waive their rights to this, um, but it encompasses things like their financial aid, their billing information, their grades, and their disciplinary information. So this is a conversation you'll need to have in the summer to know who's dealing with these things, because if you try to call up and find out how much the bill is or something like that, and there's no waiver on file, we can't give you the information. Um, there was something else that I wanted to tell you about that, and I can't remember it, but hopefully it will pop back in my head. When you do have a question too, don't be afraid to talk to the financial aid office. We're happy to help you, we're happy to help you for free. You have your counseling office. You have toll-free phone numbers on everything that I gave out tonight. You can call the Department of Education for free. You can call the state of New Jersey for free if you have questions. It's so much better to ask the questions ahead of time and get the appropriate answer so that you're submitting things that are, um, that are correct. And if you were thinking about spending money on someone to help you through this process, like I said, you've got all the information here tonight for free. The main thing that I say about this process is that it takes a little bit of time. I know that time is money, but it really just takes a little bit of time, time to complete the FAFSA, time to research and read about the different aid programs so that you're not in shock when you get the financial aid award letters and you have a bit of an understanding before that happens of what you might be eligible for. And some questions that you can consider as you move forward in the financial aid process. If your student qualifies for a scholarship or grant, is it renewable? What are the criteria? Many times with scholarships, a student may need to maintain a particular grade point average to continue to receive that award. So you want to know what it is ahead of time. The student is receiving federal work study. What are the policies related to the positions? Is there a job guaranteed? How do I get it? How much do I make? You've been lucky, you're getting a couple of outside scholarships. You want to know how they're going to be treated within that student's financial aid package. Will any of the other aid be reduced now that I have this additional resource? Any other expenses that you should be prepared for? Um, you've decided to borrow the loan to pay for books. Can it be used directly in the bookstore? And how do we go about that? And just another financial thing, the banking options that are on campus so that you know that your student has a way to access money. And more importantly, a way for you to put money into the account for them to access. But you want to know where those local banking options are, particularly if they're going away, um, so that they do have access to money. So I congratulate you all. You made it to the end of the program. I do appreciate you all coming out tonight. But like I said in the beginning, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, hmm. Just need one second here. Yes, I will. I will. Okay, so who wants to be first?